car windows are transparent to visible light. This visible light enters the car and is absorbed by the car's interior. Think of black vinyl seats. You'll feel they get quite hot to the touch. That's because they've transformed the visible light into infrared, which is a form of heat. The windows, however, are opaque to the infrared, which means the infrared can't escape. Instead, it remains in the car, which just gets warmer and warmer. This is the same principle behind a greenhouse, which helps to keep plants warm on cold but sunny days. It's called the greenhouse effect. Like glass, Earth's atmosphere is transparent to visible light, yet opaque to infrared. That's how the atmosphere helps to keep our planet warm, which is a very good thing. If not for the greenhouse effect, Earth's surface would be a chilly minus 18 degrees Celsius. They are select minor components of the atmosphere that are directly responsible for this greenhouse effect. We call these greenhouse gases. By far the most significant greenhouse gas is water vapor, primarily because there's so much of it in the atmosphere, up to 50,000 parts per million in humid locations. The second most significant greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide, which now hovers around a concentration of 400 ppm. More potent than water vapor or carbon dioxide is methane. The concentration of methane, however, is relatively low compared to that of water vapor and carbon dioxide. Because of the action of the water cycle, the amount of water in the atmosphere remains fairly constant. Add more water to the atmosphere, it simply comes out as precipitation. The only thing that will increase the amount of water in the atmosphere is an increase in the average global temperature. We'll talk more about that in the next lesson. What about carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide is an integral part of the carbon cycle. Each year, we release about 9 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation. About 3 gigatons of this are absorbed by the oceans through some very interesting acid-base chemistry we discuss in another chapter. Another 2 gigatons are absorbed by vegetation. The remaining 4 gigatons just accumulates in the atmosphere from year to year. So, because we're producing carbon dioxide faster than it can be absorbed, the levels of CO2 have been rising. Nowhere is this more clear than in what has become known as the Keeling Curve, which plots direct measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide from 1958 on up to the present. The waviness of the graph is a result of seasonal changes. In the spring, plants absorb carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, causing the levels to go down. It goes back up as plants lose their leaves, which decay to produce carbon dioxide, in the fall. These things are very measurable. And as you can see, year after year, the levels have been increasing. We can also track directly the carbon dioxide we produce from industrial and other activities. This is accelerating in step with the accelerating atmospheric CO2 levels. There's no question but that the rise of the Keeling curve is due to us. Earth is large, yes, but so is our ability to have significant impact. Again, from the collective level. What you're looking at here is a computer-generated representation of 2006 CO2 emission data. This makes two things very clear. One, most all the activity is in the northern hemisphere. And two, carbon dioxide knows no political boundaries. Okay, so we've recently passed the threshold of 400 ppm. Before the Industrial Revolution, this was around 280 ppm. And all the evidence collected so far indicates that over the past 420,000 years, the level of CO2 has averaged about 240 ppm. Never in this time frame has it been over 400. Over the past 420,000 years, this is unique. And over that time span, we've gone through many warm spells and ice ages, each one in step with rising or falling CO2 levels. Maybe it's just a coincidence that the past decades have been the hottest on record, while levels of CO2 have also been at record highs. After all, correlation is not necessarily causation. Indeed, past climate changes show CO2 levels rising after temperature increases. So carbon dioxide need not be the cause 
but rather it can be an effect that then reinforces further increases in temperature. While that's true, it's not necessarily always true. Carbon dioxide can also be the cause. It is, after all, a potent greenhouse gas. Volcanoes have been emitting only about 0.2 gigatons of carbon each year, compared to our 9 gigatons. There's been no massive load of methane from the depths of the ocean, which has happened before with catastrophic results. There's been no unusual tectonic activity. There's been no change in the solar constant. In the next climate-changing planetary cycle, due to the eccentricities in our orbit, it's not due for thousands of years. In the science community, there's plenty of debate over the details, but not about the fundamental conclusion. Human-produced carbon dioxide remains the most likely cause of recent average global temperature increases. And this is the consensus of over 99% of all climate scientists. Hey, you're cold lying in bed. What do you do? You grab a bunch of blankets. You know well that the more blankets you've got, the warmer you get. Why? Because the blankets help to hold in your heat. Carbon dioxide is a blanket. The more we add to the atmosphere, the warmer we get. And it's getting warmer as we add more CO2. What, you think it might suddenly start to cool off? You're forgetting about the oceans. We're on a freight train full of coal. Once rolling, it's difficult to stop. During the time of the dinosaurs, records show that CO2 levels were over 1,000 ppm. The dinosaurs thrived in this warm environment for millions of years. Of course, there were no ice caps, and the sea level was 170 meters higher than it is now. Okay. You know, life will very likely persist on Earth quite nicely at higher CO2 levels. That's not the question. The question is whether we humans will be able to adapt. Consider half of us live within 40 miles of the ocean, which are already rising due to thermal expansion and glacial melting. Glacial melting? The melting of the Greenland ice cap alone will raise sea levels by about 7 meters, destroying the Gulf Stream ocean current in the process. Okay, assuming these changes in climate do happen, what kind of time frames are we talking about? 50 years? 200 years? 1,000 years? Let's explore that idea in the next lesson. Good chemistry to you. Mm-hmm.